Hello, plant people. How are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley, and I like to take science and apply it to all things plants, both indoors and outside. And today's video, we're going to be talking about the difference between no dig and top dressing compost versus actually incorporating compost into the soil and which choice may be best for you. But first, today's video does have a sponsor and that is Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of aspiring classes for anyone who loves learning and wants to explore their creativity learn new skills and invest in yourself or your personal growth. If you have specific skills you're trying to learn, Skillshare is the place to do it. The reason for this is because Skillshare actually does classes. So when you decide you want to learn about a specific topic, what you can do is take the class, which is a start to finish tutorial on how to do the project. So I've actually used this on my own to help with the YouTube channel. I've used it to look at how to film properly, how to work on lighting, how to edit videos, how to do SEO descriptions. They've even helped me with website design, my podcast, you name it. I use it for a major part of my entrepreneurship journey. I've actually enjoyed Skillshare so much over the years that I've actually considered making a course, a gardening in Canada course, where I go over very specific gardening topics in great detail, start to finish. It allows you to not only have readable descriptions, and resources. It has a community area where you can actually discuss and share tips and tricks, photos in regards to the specific project you're working on, and overall is a more community feel centered around a specific topic. It's all ad free so you can stay in the zone while you're exploring your new skill. All the classes are premium content meaning that they are the best of the best and it's a thorough how-to on a number of different skills. I'm literally talking anything and everything is on Skillshare. The first thousand people to use the link down in the description will get one month free using Skillshare so you can experience the wide range of courses, whether you're trying to harness a new skill or you're simply looking to unwind with knowledge. Needless to say, this is definitely a platform for us nerdy folk out there. With that being said, let's try to harness the skill of whether or not we should top dress or incorporate compost. So first off, what is what is top dressing? Top dressing is the equivalent of the Charles Dowding no dig. It's been something that's been used for ages and is simply the addition of organic material, in this case compost, to the soil surface. The depth of a top dressing scenario may differ. It can be a half inch, it can be upwards of five inches, and in some cases I've seen people do entire garden raised beds with this being used. Now keep in mind Charles Dowding No Dig doesn't encourage you to use seven inches of compost, it's just what some people chose to do with the compost that they've been given. For the purposes of this video, I'm not going to recommend that you dump compost on in anything more than the biomass that is removed. The reason for this is because excess compost is not good for the environment. It can result in volatilization, which is essentially the gassing off of carbon monoxide, nitrous oxide, and various other different greenhouse gases. And leaching can happen when soluble nutrients is able to run off with water due to an excess of nutrients that the plant does not need, which can also happen in the case of excess compost being added. So when I'm talking about top dressing in this video, I'm referencing the addition of compost to the equivalent of if you were to remove all the upper biomass that that garden produced from the year before, compost it, and then reapply it, how much would you be adding? Probably an inch, maybe two. That's what I'm referencing in this video. When I'm referencing incorporating of the actual compost, I'm again referencing enough compost to amend an area preferably to a depth of approximately 12 to 16 inches, and in this case may involve more compost, anywhere from five to six inches, but again, incorporated into the soil's profile. So the benefits when we're using a no-dig 
one to two inches is that we have little to no compaction, fewer weeds, and it's just prettier looking. We don't have the cracking and the aggregation and just the general ugliness that soil can get. Some unseen benefits to using the no dig is that we have better control over moisture retention and the moisture delivered to the plant, meaning we don't have excess. Some of the unseen benefits in the case of compost is that we can build upwards. So if we have a poor soil foundation, for example, I've worked with Jessica out at the Wilkes Bar Community Garden where they were building on an old church foundation. There was lots of uh, brick and cement and that sort of thing. Being able to build upwards is going to be key in that scenario. Again, if you have a waterlogged soil, maybe you have a very sandy soil, that's another reason to build up rather than incorporating in. It's going to be much easier to deal with and if you have any level of mobility issues or you just want to reduce the labor involved, this may be the solution for you. One thing you need to keep in mind is if you're growing in this scenario, the more compost you put on, the, the farther and farther you get away from growing in soil. You're technically growing soilless plants. Because compost is simply taking plant biomass and decomposing it into really high concentrations, we end up with high concentrations of whatever was contained within those plants. This includes herbicides, pesticides, obviously insecticides, fungicides, you name it, but it also includes micronutrients that can be amplified as well. If we don't allow our compost to cure and for things like allelopathic chemicals to be decomposed and immobilized in that soil, we may end up with that also showing up in our gardens. This can show up from lack of germination, poor germination, poor seedling stand, and even adult curling and cupping. I did an entire video on what happened to Jessica from Roots and Refuges soil, so be sure to check that out if you are currently experiencing any pesticide issues with your plants due to potential compost. One of the best ways to help regulate or determine if a compost is ready to go and doesn't contain any compounds that may be harmful would be to do a bioassays test, which I also did an entire video on as well. Now, one solution to compost issues is dilution. And one of the best ways to actually dilute that is through incorporating it with the soil. So one thing I will say about compost is that it does contain plants. So therefore it's slightly better than that of other materials that may not have high levels of micronutrients. The major benefit to using soil is that it's technically glacial bedrock that has been ground up into a fine powder, meaning it has a, a wider range of different elements, some of which plants need, others that which plants do not. Another thing to keep in mind is quite often compost from a vendor in a bag is usually pH neutralized, either using sulfur to bring that pH down or lime to bring that pH up. But with soil, it naturally is able to buffer itself, bringing it in around 6.5. Mother Nature does things best and soil is one of them. However, soil can be compacted. It can lack organic material. And because of lack of organic material, we can have less than stellar results. If we have a lack of carbon, we have a lower cation exchange capacity, a poor water holding capacity, and relatively no air in the system. Oxygen needs to be present for microbes to nutrient cycle and for roots to even process nutrients properly, which means in order for a soil to become its ideal form, we need to incorporate organics. Now this can be a one-time application for many of us where we simply add again, five to six inches of compost and then till it into the soil at a depth of 12 to 16 inches in the entire profile. Again, one-time application will help with aggregation, increase microbial activity through introducing oxygen, and overall help with soil structure and aggregation in the future. As that organic material begins to decompose, it will allow for root channels and areas for air to penetrate the actual soil surface. It's a great way to actually increase the water holding capacity of a sandy soil that otherwise may be deprived of water, and it's an awesome way to actually add aeration to a soil that may otherwise be compacted. So what you choose to do is ultimately down to you. I would take into account your budget, what you're able to actually purchase, whether that be a rototiller and excessive amounts of compost, 
or if building up is a better solution. The other thing that you may wanna take into consideration is your mobility in the near future. If you are best suited to work in a raised bed, you may wanna consider a garden soil where you're going to use compost and soil in combination with one another in a garden bed because you will not have to refill it or top it up over time. This is because compost on its own will not aggregate and have a structure to it. It's pretty homogenous in nature. Um, regardless of the soil building activities we try, you will never end up with a perfect clump of compost that can be pulled out and handled. It will generally just fall apart. And this is because it doesn't have the glues that soil technically does have. And this can be form found in loam soils all the way to clay soils, but is less prevalent in a sandy soil. Regardless of what you choose, you may or may not want to consider doing either or and seeing which performs best for you. And if you want to take an actual real life look at what some of this looks like, I actually encourage you to go check out Mind and Soil's YouTube video. I was helping him along with different garden beds and he's doing a comparison of a pure compost raised bed, a soil raised bed, and then a compost vermiculite raised bed. And the results are shocking. The compost bed is doing the poorest, the soil bed is doing the middle and the best result is actually the vermiculite compost bed. The reason for that is because vermiculite technically is a form of inorganic material like soil that has just been expanded and under that expansion we've ended up with a higher water holding capacity. So BC currently can is getting pretty warm and due to that heat it can stress the roots. So the plants are able to cool off because our water holding capacity is highest in the vermiculite compost bed, whereas our water holding is the lowest in the pure compost bed and the soil bed is in between. This water holding capacity is ultimately affecting how quickly the soil structure in and of itself is heating up and ultimately how quickly those roots are heating up. So it's an interesting experiment if you wanna take a look at the different results. I personally have done compost beds, I've done garden soil beds, and soil is my favorite. I find that I don't end up with nearly as many micronutrient issues. I don't end up with micronutrient uh, influxes. I don't have to regulate the pH as much. My fertilizer, it doesn't really have to be added. It's pretty self-regulating um, on its own. And I'm able to get aggregation without having to continually add or top up the product. So if you guys enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, and let me know in the comments down below if you're a pure compost, pure soil, or a combination of the two. And I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye!